Hello aspirants, uh, very warm welcome to Olive Board. This is Rohan Dange, your faculty for finance today. And in today's lecture, I will be talking about a very important aspect, which is banking sector and financial sector reforms in India. So let's begin with that. See, the banking sector reforms are very important. Why? Because the banking system helps in capital accumulation, growth by encouraging savings, mobilizing the capital, and allocating the capital for alternative uses, etc. What is capital accumulation? Capital accumulation is basically where you are trying to mobilize money in the economy. Today we are living in a post-pandemic world. And in this post-pandemic world, there are various, uh, I mean, economies are slowing down. Because of that, consumption is also going down and private sector investment is also at an all-time low because of high rates of unemployment we have seen that and because of low levels of consumption and low levels of private sector investments we see that capital accumulation is not happening right so once that when a situation like that occurs it is a banking system which catalyzes the growth in capital accumulation which triggers capital formation what happens when you don't have money you go to the bank and you ask for a loan right whether it is a home loan whether it is a personal loan or a vehicle loan you go to a bank and the bank helps you in mobilizing money that's how the wheels of the economy are kept in constant state of motion the banks quite naturally they encourage savings all of us have a savings account with the bank and we receive a certain amount of money through the bank right through savings then of course you can mobilize the capital also mobilizing the capital means making sure that private sector and certain various sectors like pharmaceuticals agriculture automobiles right textiles these sectors which are key they receive what you can say they receive a critical amount of money right that is how you encourage sectoral growth in an economy by mobilizing the capital right and also allocating the capital for alternative uses as well so what happens when you allocate capital for alternative uses you ensure that economies various sectors which were not in the financial main frame they are brought into the main frame like agricultural sector cooperative sector handicraft sector handloom sector right micro small and uh, medium scale industries fisheries right these are the sectors which also require banking attention so the banks get you that kind of attention it is the banks which help us or it is the banks which help in mobilizing money in an economy okay so why reforms why are reforms needed because the indian economy witnessed now see today we are living in a post pandemic world but the indian economy has been in the need of reforms since a long time so the main reason behind the banking sector and the financial sector reforms was basically india was in the 1980s india had taken a huge loan there was a huge debt burden on india back in those times and why was that debt burden is because under the rajiv gandhi government the government had taken a lot of loan telecom revolution was knocking on the door india wanted it was the rise of a new india in 1983 india had won the cricket world cup right india was also going to host the commonwealth games right so india was again trying to make its mark felt and presence felt on the international scene international arena but for that of course a lot of rebuilding and a lot of infrastructural development was needed of course all of that could not have been mobilized without without uh, infusing without the infusion of financial resources but apparently the indian economy has never been a rich economy the per capita gdp has never been very high it has always been in a low middle income category 
as a result of that as a result of lack of capital accumulation or lack of capital formation the government had to look out for other sources of more revenue mobilization which is external sector borrowings or borrowings from institutions like world bank imf developed countries like japan us uk but once you start taking a loan the debt starts piling up in the economy and once the debt starts piling up you have to start paying the you have to you are you have you have the obligation to pay an interest amount on that generally the hope is that once such loans such international loans are taken they will create assets they will create a stream of revenue and by using that the interest amount shall be paid but unfortunately in india's case there were other factors because of which infrastructural development could, could not reach the heights that it was expected to and at that point in time there was some amount of reckless spending also on part of the government on top of that you had the gulf oil crisis in the late 80 late uh, 80s and the early 90s because of which oil had also become expensive there was a high rate of inflation inflation because any high rate of crude oil is directly proportional to inflation by 1991 the situation had reached such a boiling point that the debt levels in india had become completely unsustainable levels and not just that not just the debt levels but now the country was the economy of the country was being crushed to the point where imf and world bank had also refused to bail out indian economy although there was one condition on which they were ready to bail out indian economy and the condition was very very simple that india adopt the 10 principles of washington consensus as enunciated within the imf's charter washington consensus is nothing but a set of 10 principles which is about opening up the economy liberalizing the economy privatizing the economy and allowing private sector participation in 17 out of 22 sectors so reforms were needed because of the gulf oil crisis because of the fact that our generally political patronage scientific uh, technology transfer and fund transfer used to happen from ussr ussr was a big elder brother to india but in 1991 the collapse of the former ussr also led to a situation where in indian economy was in a dire state to the point where india had to literally pledge its gold reserves most of the gold had set sail right most of the gold had set sail to washington but thanks to the erudite leaders that we had that is pv narsimha rao manmohan singh who was the then finance minister and montek singh alu alia who is a former chairman of the planning commission or former vice chairman of the planning commission deputy chairman i would say because of these visionary individuals india accepted the washington consensus and the gold that we had already pledged to imf that had come back right so these were the prevailing circumstances under which reforms were initiated in india there were many reforms like the tax reforms liberalization privatization and reforms in the financial sector reforms of the banking sector legal reforms now banking sector and financial sector reforms is what concerns us today initially let me tell you that when you talk about banking sector reforms it was about liberalizing rbi's interest rate policy the banks were always under the obligation and the amraj of reserve bank and the reserve bank used to set a fixed interest rate and the banks had to follow but after the banking sector reforms now the interest rate policy was liberalized and now you could follow or anybody any bank could follow any policy or any interest rate so this was the overall objective so reforms were aimed at bringing a transformation change in the structure efficiency 
and stability of the banking system and also integration with the international markets. There was also a felt need to make Indian banks internationally competitive and encourage them to play an effective role in accelerating the process of growth. The reforms in the banking sector in India intended to enhance the stability and efficiency of banks quite naturally. Okay. So therefore, these banking sector reforms were utterly necessary. It was also about removing the operational rigidities in the credit delivery system. What is the credit delivery system? The credit delivery system is basically accessibility to loans. Okay. Now, for example, agricultural sector. The agricultural sector in India was such that it did not, there was a huge paucity of funds. And also a lot of farmers in India, they do not have banking accounts. So because of lack of financial inclusion, this sector was generally cash starved, right? It was always cash strapped. And because of a lot of paperwork involved, there were certain operational rigidities which made the agricultural sector and the farmers which made it difficult for them to be a part of this loan taking and loan giving mechanism. When you talk about the social objectives, social objectives are basically centered around or geared towards the development of society, creation of social infrastructure like education and healthcare, right? And also making sure that the villages are connected through a network of roads, welfare obligations, poverty eradication programs, right? For all of these objectives also a lot of money is required and the banking sector could play a key role. So to place the Indian banking system on par with international standards in respect of capital adequacy and other prudential norms, the reforms were carried out. What do you understand by this? See when you talk about capital adequacy, it is about the money that the reserve banks have, that the other banks, commercial, scheduled commercial banks have. Right. So it was essential to ensure that they had a lot of money at their disposal to the tune where they could actually match the performance of the international standards. Okay. It was also aimed at strengthening measures to reduce the vulnerability of banks in the face of fluctuations in the economic environment. These included capital adequacy, income recognition, asset classification, provisioning norms. All of this will be covered when you join the classes for Olive Board in which I will be talking in detail about what is asset classification, what is provisioning, what are exposure norms, right? These may sound as fairly technical terms to you. This is banking jargon for you but this will be adequately explained to you. Okay. Now when you talk about the banking sector reforms, it all started with the Narsimhan Committee Report 1 in 1991. The Narsimhan Committee was set up in order to study the problems of the Indian financial system and to suggest some recommendations for improvement in the efficiency and productivity of the financial institutions. So the committee has given some recommendations. Let's take a look at that. First is the reduction in the SLR and CRR. So the committee recommended the reduction of the higher proportion of the SLR and CRR. What is SLR and what is CRR will be explained to you in the monetary policy that we will conduct or the lecture on monetary policy that we have already recorded for Olive Board. SLR basically stands for statutory liquidity ratio and CRR. CRR stands for cash reserve ratio. One can simply say that SLR is the money that the banks have to submit or the banks have to keep with RBI in the form of liquid form that could be gold also that could be cash also. And cash reserve ratio is the amount of cash that the banks have to keep with themselves. At that point in time SLR was 38.5 and CRR was 15%. So almost so that's about how much? 53.5%. So out of 100 rupees, the banks had to lock up 53.5 rupees with either themselves or with the RBI. That meant that bank could, banks could give only 47 rupees in the form of loan after having mobilized 100 rupees through deposits. Correct? 
I have already explained the business of banking to you in the previous lectures. So this high amount of SLR and CRR meant that it locked the bank's resources for government uses. And it was a hindrance in the productivity of the bank. Thus the committee recommended their gradual reduction. And today if you take a look at it, the current and prevailing SLR is around 15% and the CRR is around 4%. Now these are not the accurate figures, but they are more or less, you can take an allowance of plus minus 1% here. Right. Initially, in the first phase, the SLR was recommended to be reduced from 38.5% to 25% and CRR was uh, reduced from 15% to 3, 3 to 5%. Today, it is somewhere in the range of 4%. The second thing was phasing out directed credit program. Directed credit program is basically meant for certain sectors which have uh, generally been out of the mainframe of financial systems. Now in India since nationalization, right, when did the banking nationalization happen in India? 1969. The first phase of banking nationalization happened under the Prime Ministership of Indira Gandhi in 1969 and the second phase happened in 1980 where many private sector banks were converted to public sector banks, correct? Now the reverse of that has started happening in India wherein many nationalized banks have now been privatized or the government is disinvesting its uh, stakes within these banks. So here uh, different times will ask and expect different measures. So in India since nationalization, directed credit programs were adopted by the government and the committee recommended phasing out of this program. Right. Why? Because at, at the end of the day, banking business is what? It is nothing but a business of making money. Right. It is a profit making endeavor. It is a profit making initiative. Now when you are compelling the banks to flush money into a particular sector, then you are greatly impinging on the bank's autonomy to take decisions for their own selves. And quite naturally, you are eroding the bank's capacity to make profits. So the program compelled banks to earmark the then financial resources for the needy and the poor at concessional rates of interest. Right, so suppose you are giving 100 rupees loans out in the market. Out of that, 18 rupees should go to the needy and the poor. So here you are rationalizing. You are not unnecessarily putting 60 rupees into that particular sector. You are putting 18 rupees. So you are making sure that the poor and the needy also get uh, a coverage under the banking system. And at the same time, an adequate amount of cash is reserved or adequate amount of cash is made free for the private sector consumption as well. Right. So the phasing directed credit programs were reducing the profitability of the banks and quite naturally keeping that in view, the nursing one committee recommended the stopping of this program. Then there were prudential norms. The prudential norms were started by Reserve Bank of India in order to impart professionalism in the commercial banks. And the purpose of prudential norms includes proper disclosure of income, classification of assets and provision of bad debts so as to ensure that the books of commercial banks reflect the accurate and correct picture of financial position. Prudential norms required banks to make 100% provisions for all NPAs. What are NPAs? Whatever loans that the banks have given, if they are not coming back into the system, if the EMIs are not being paid, then you can say that that asset, because a loan is an asset, that asset has now become a non-performing asset because you are quite naturally not making any money on that. So it is not performing for the bank. So prudential norms required banks to make 100% provision. That means if I am, if my non-performing, if I have 10 crores of non-performing assets, then I will set aside 10 crore as a cushion for the bank. That is 100% provisioning. If, if the total size of my NPAs is 10 crores and if there is 50% provisioning, then I will keep aside 5 crore rupees, right? But the nursing one committee, one report suggested that 100% provisioning should be done for all non-performing assets and funding for this purpose was placed at rupees 10,000 crores which was spread out over a period of two years. Now the jargon like capital adequacy norms may befuddle you, may flummox you but at the end of the day it's a very simple thing. You have to keep aside a portion of your capital that is a portion of your money right in comparison to the loans that you have given. Now with the loans that you give, there is already an inherent risk associated with that. 
isn't it? There is always a risk associated with that. There is, I mean, 10% risk, 8% risk, it could be anything. So capital adequacy ratio is the ratio of minimum capital to risk, uh, uh, risk asset ratio, right? That means of the total amount of capital that the bank has, a certain amount of money has to be kept aside. So in April 1992, the Reserve Bank of India fixed capital adequacy norms at 8%. And by March 1996, all public sector banks had attained the ratio of 8%. And this particular condition was also meant for foreign banks. As I told you, the committee also recommended eliminating government controls on the interest rate. Now, RBI did not have a direct control. The banks were free to fix their own interest rates. And now, that also led to the phasing out of the concessional interest rates for the priority sector. Then there is something called as the recovery of debts. The government of India passed the recovery of debts due to banks and financial institutions act 1993 in order to facilitate and speed up the recovery of debts due to banks and financial institutions. Now this was a statutory and a legal mechanism that was passed to ensure that see a lot of debt was due to the banks but it was not coming back into the system. There was a necessity for making a law framework for the recovery of these debts. Otherwise, the banks would suffer huge losses. And therefore, this statutory provision was, in, uh, was passed in order to facilitate and speed up the recovery of debts due to banks and financial institutions. There were six special recovery tribunals which were set up and an appellate tribunal had also been set up in the financial capital of India, that is Mumbai. Uh, the Narsim one, one committee report also some, uh, focused on the structural reorganization of the banking sector. The committee recommended that the actual numbers of public sector banks need to be reduced, which is what is happening in today's India also. We are trying to reduce the number of public sector banks because they are sitting on a lot of non-performing assets. So ideally, according to the Narsim one committee report, there should be only three to four big banks, including the State Bank of India. And they should be developed as international banks and there should be eight to ten banks which would have a nationwide presence and they should concentrate on national and universal banking services so they should focus on financial inclusion through inclusive growth and local banks there should be the third tier consisting of the local banks who should concentrate on region specific banking uh, of course there is a specialized set of banks also that is the regional rural banks and the committee recommended that they should focus on only agriculture and rural financing. They also recommended that the government should assure that henceforth there won't be any nationalization and private and foreign banks should be allowed liberal entry in India. There should be the establishment of the Asset Reconstruction Fund Tribunal, the proportion of bad debts and non-performing assets of the public sector banks and development financial institution was very alarming in those days which is, I think, is the case even today. So the committee recommended the establishment of an ARF, which is Asset Reconstruction Fund. So the basic objective of the fund was to take over the proportion of the bad and the doubtful debts from the banks and financial institutes. Initi in eventually, it would help the bank get rid of the bad debts, which is like which was like infecting the banking system and which had spread like a cancer within the banking system. Now regarding the competition from the new private sector banks, which is also a need of the hour, with the influx and with the inclusion of the private sector banks, with the entry of the private sector banks, the level of competition in the Indian banking sector improved, right? And these new private sector banks were allowed to raise capital contribution from even foreign institutional investors to the tune of 20% and from NRIs to the tune of 40%. So because of the added avenues from where capital could be mobilized. There was a great influx of private sector banks like Citibank, Bank of America, ANZ, Grindley's, Dausch Bank, right, RBS and so on and so forth. So that also led to, I mean, uh, Standard Chartered, HSBC being the leaders. So that also led to increased competition. Now access to capital market. A statutory provision was made in the form of the Banking Companies Acquisition and Transfer of Undertakings Act and that was amended to enable the banks to raise capital through public issues. Now what are public issues? If the bank or for that matter any other company wants to mobilize funds, it can mobilize funds from the people also. 
from investors also by issuing certificates by issuing their shares by issuing their bonds so now banks this act was amended to ensure that the banks would also raise capital by releasing or by uh, what you can say issuing public documents like bonds this was obviously conditional because this was subject to the provision that the holding of the central government would not fall below 51% of the paid up capital that means if there was any disinvestment to make sure to ensure mobilization of money that that disinvestment should not fall down below 51% because in that case the government would lose controlling ownership over the bank and that would be detrimental to the entire business of banking at least the welfare obligations within the banking system because it is the government which ensures welfare the private sector or the private banks they only ensure profit maximization so it is important that some banks are still within government control right so this particular act was amended to enable the banks to raise capital through public issues no doubt they could issue their they could divest their shares they could disinvest their bonds but this was subject to the provision that the holding of the central government would not fall below 51% of paid up capital the state bank of india has already raised a substantial amount of funds through equity and bonds and nowadays you will see a lot of banks are uh, being uh, disinvested right if you're keeping a tab on the news you will understand this removal of dual control see there were there was overarching and overlapping control in india when it comes to reserve bank of india and the ministry of finance and that led to a lot of chaos and confusion right you want an overarching framework for regulating the banking system you do not want a dual regulatory system because that would only create more and more mess so the narasimhan committee recommended the stepping of this test system and it considered and recommended that the reserve bank of india should only become the main agency to regulate the banking system in india and it continues to do so in 2021 as well in fact the reserve bank of india is the apex regulator of the banking system in our country which is charged with the responsibility of inflation targeting that's how you will talk about reserve bank of india today so with this we come to the end of this lecture i hope that this was a great rejoinder for you once you join our batches at olive board you will get a lot of these sessions which will ensure and enable that your grip on the topics gets increased and maximized wherein we are going to cover every piece of your syllabus through your through our lectures and through our ppts so till the time we meet next this is rohan dange signing off from olive board thank you take care be good